They were at St Gothlack Church. Now, you may recall on Quest 12, this is now Quest 13, um, we came here at some ungodly hour of the night where we certainly experienced um, lots of sensations out in the graveyard and in the, the, the rear section of the building there. Um, very interesting um, church. It's certainly got a lot of energy and warmth about it. Um, there's not that many plaques around, which is quite interesting for a church that's currently, the current building has been modified 800 years ago. But there's also been sites on here prior to that. So it's quite, um, as my colleague said as well, it's quite a simple church, but it, it leaves a lot of things untold. Um, this in particular is quite nice. You've got the original um, to the sick and needy donations, which is quite good to help the local people, um, which I found quite interesting. There's, there's a few, I wouldn't say there's too many things here of um, significance that's on display. Um, as such, the, the ball bit's pretty straightforward. What I particularly liked here was the scepters. Um, we've got, on this one, um, we've certainly got uh, your three swords and we've got the red and silver. Now the red and silver we know is part of the Neville line. Um, the red and silver represents blood and honour, back to the battle. So red for blood obviously and the silver for honour. Um, one would ask why the silver is for honour, it's quite simple. Silver was a good way of monetary exchange in that particular period in England and other places. So you could exchange silver like you would gold really. So that's certainly there. And on this one's particularly interesting, it's quite discreet in its way, but it actually has the, I don't know if you can see, you've got the serpent whips there. Um, and, but what's more interesting is the serpent whips are actually positioned in the Masonic realm of the wisdom, strength and beauty, the three pillars of creation, wisdom, strength and beauty. And it's, I just found that particularly interesting on how we've, I don't know how much you've got that on the camera, but um, I found that particularly interesting how they position those into Masonic value. Um, so there's certainly uh, an element here of um, Masonic virtue, should we say. R round the sides, as you can see, if we look down the aisle, it's, um, it's a very interesting, quaint church for the market town. If we go further down, um, it almost seems quite surreal because one of the entrances has been closed over a period of time. Um, and certainly, this entrance was actually open in the year 1591. So, you know, we're, we're looking at some interesting things as to why, why did they close it up? Uh, was it for practicality? Um, we can see here we've got the original archway of the entrance. I say this got closed up shortly after the year 1591. Um, and that's, that's quite interesting. The, in front of the entrance, we have then the tombs being relayed in front of the entrance, which I, I found a little bit surreal as to why that would be there. Um, but as we look around, the, the things that have been kept, which are quite important, we see this in many churches, are the six points of redemption, I, you probably don't know how much you can get on the camera, but you've got the six almost like gargoyle statue faces, which is quite normal in the churches of the period. However, you do then have wooden statues on the beams, not coloured, but very discreet six wooden statues on the beams right up there in the nave. So that's quite, quite interesting as well. What do we know about this place? Well, we know um, that it's dedicated to St Guflak, and St Guflak was... was born in the region of 643, 673, some scholars will argue. Um, he's well known for the slaying, or should I say the whipping, of demons, which is why perhaps the tales of demonology is here quite strong in the graveyard. He was, um, he's dedicated to the church. Um, we see the whips represented in pillars on that particular sector down there, um, which is quite interesting as well. So St. Guthach was a very interesting guy. There is talk that he was in the early stages of, um, dare I use the term, black magic. Now we know in the orthodox side of Judaism, in the Judaic culture, black magic is used continuously, whether people choose to believe that or not. Um, as a researcher, I've, I've found much information to prove that Judaism, in fact, follows a very deep level of black magic. Um, it's one how one portrays that. So it's interesting that we see St Guthlac 
which I shall put on to tape that my research proves that he is of a Judaic nature that ends up being into the Christian form of a church to then be made a saint from a Judaic background. So that, that's, um, which again isn't unheard of. I mean, we've, we've seen at various churches around, the Star of David, the Six Point Char, the Mechabah, the, the Kaaba, whatever you want to call it, we've seen the symbology of modern Judaism in most churches that we've been to in one shape or form or another. Um, in particular, um, we need to also look at the association to the Ford surname here. Now we know that the Ford and the Fordhams are in bed with each other in earlier times in period. We know that a lot of people make the assumption, which is dangerous, of Ford Fordham being directly related to the village of Fordham in Cambridgeshire. That's not strictly true. It's about the, the, the Ford and the Ham. The Ham is the homestead and the Ford is where the river runs by. Well, there's many places in England, in Ireland, in Scotland, Wales, anywhere you want to go where there will be settlements where rivers run by. And so Fordham was a, a name developed over a period of time and the migrational pattern also proves that. For this particular church, it has a great link with um, the Ford family, um, although there's not a great deal of history to find in the general public domain. Um, if we can take ourselves to 1591, when a gentleman called John Ford was here at the church and was involved in this particular works and things, it would be quite interesting to, to um, look at that, and that's certainly one thing to look for. for. Away from a historic point of view, we've got um, the talks of demons, as we mentioned, the demons in the, in the main area, the spooks. I mean, we certainly had our fair share, and one of my colleagues certainly got a picture of an orb uh, when she took pictures in the graveyard at night time before. No light reflection, no camera lens, glare. It was definitely an orb in that sense, as, um, as she proclaims, and I truly believe that. There's certainly much more here than meets the eye. In regards to um, sightings of demons roaming the graveyards, we've got some particular years in question for anyone who'd like to research that. We've got 1639, 1703, and the year 1921. Those three particular periods were when there was alleged heightened activity of, of ghostly tales and whispers in the yards. So um, that's one thing to look at. So as I walk around, it seems quite warm, and again, the atmosphere seems to change when you're in, in here. It's like if it was warmer up there and colder down here, and I don't know whether we. I'm not feeling a great deal of love, that's for sure. I'm not feeling a lot of happiness in this church. What I'm feeling really is a lot of um, concern, really. And that's what I sense here, concern. There's always been masked in its, in its fairy tale venture. It's always been masked into its, the beauty of its simplicity, yet it feels to me that something much far, far greater something far more sinister has tales to tell about this particular church. 